Hi, good morning. Can't believe it's happening again. NG Conf. All right, thanks everyone for coming out. We're going to talk a lot about what's going on in the world of Angular. And to kick this all off, I want to talk about why we do Angular. Because, you know, once you get into Google, you've got a lot of options of places you could work. We could be working on YouTube or Gmail or any number of fun things. Why, why do we do Angular for the folks who work on it? And a lot of it comes down to our values. And for us, it's about building or making it possible to build applications that users really love to use on a framework that makes us productive and makes us love our jobs as developers in a community where we all feel welcome, that where we can all support each other to grow, we can feel like we can be successful. And I'll drill down into each one of these, but I'm going to start off with community. By the way, I love the messages that Tara and uh, Aaron had earlier today. But we're so excited with how fast the Angular community has been growing. And if we look at just the last three months of the year last year, 2017, we can see that we actually passed a really critical benchmark where we, pass, we have over a million developers coming to the Angular.io website every month. This is just incredible. If we look now, we actually have over 1.25 million developers coming every month. So the growth is incredible. Thank you so much for being part of this. Thanks for making Angular like one of the most adopted frameworks on the planet. As you probably saw in some of the opening credits, there's meetups that happen all around the world. And I would love to encourage you to continue to be part of this community after ng-conf. Help build your local communities to support each other in learning and growing Angular on your local place. Um, there's always a place that you can get involved. And probably in your local community, there's a, there's a meetup near you. You can check them out at angular.meetup.com. A couple things that are happening that uh, folks are doing, I think, a really nice job of supporting and increasing the diversity of the Angular environment. Where one of the things I like is, uh, is NG Girls, where this organization is helping women come into the world of tech and giving free conferences around the world. They had one earlier this week. They've got one happening in Mountain View in a couple weeks. And if you'd like to find out more about how to get involved, how to participate, or how to help, go to nggirls.org to find out more. I love it how in this conference, we actually celebrate other conferences that have happened just that are part of the Angular community. One of them that happened earlier this year, NG Atlanta that I got to be part of, um, was one where there was actually over 60% of the speakers were women. And a lot of the groups that were typically not well represented were well represented at this conference. I actually kind of dragged them down by being there. But uh, it, was, it was pretty cool. I'm, I hope we can see a lot more things like this go on. I am super passionate about diversity and inclusion. If so if you're trying to do something in this area and you think I could help, please come talk to me. I would love to help you get there. <laughs> All right, so a lot of this talk, we're going to be diving into things that the Angular team itself is doing. But we also see a lot of great work happening in the community in terms of patterns libraries and tools. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of them, things that are going on in community work that extend what Angular does to show off how really this is something that we're building all together. One of the things is, uh, is this area in patterns. Um, we see a lot of companies building their own design systems on Angular. And if you're not familiar with what this is, uh, an example of a design system would be Google's material design. This is how we think about building applications that are consistent across all of Google's products. And so a lot of other companies have the same idea, that they want to have their own design system that's unique to them. And it's how they can manage design at scale so that we all look like we're building the same style of applications. And so what you usually do is you end up building some documentation that helps developers, UX folks, product managers, et cetera, think about how do we construct applications that all look and feel the same, they're cohesive. You build some supporting tools that might help you with prototyping or consistency to make sure that everything is easy to build. And then usually this comes with a component library. And so we're seeing this at many, many companies who are building these things. One example. 
uh, and they're actually here, you can talk to them on the, the show floor, would be Clarity by VMware. And Clarity was this internal system at VMware that they decided to open source. And you can see some of the components are not just the, the component library in Angular, but also there's a sketch template, so you can build static mockups. There's a set of UI guidelines, so you can really understand what we're trying to express or how to make things cohesive. And then things like HTML and CSS for doing prototypes in the environment. Steven's going to give a talk on Angular for Designers on Friday, so I encourage you to go check that out if you're in that community, or just come talk to us. We'd actually love to know how we can support you better as a design philosophy component system, like how, how you're building this at your companies. Hottest thing right now that's not from the Angular team certainly has got to be NGRX where if you're not familiar with it, this is how you could do reactive state management in your applications. There's many options, but this is one of them that seems to be gaining a lot of popularity. And really, the, the claim to fame here is it makes it just a lot easier for me to reason about how I do state management in my app. But one of the conversations I hear a lot is folks would like maybe some more ergonomic APIs, maybe write a little bit less code. And so I think one of the exciting things I've seen recently is a library called NGRX Data where if you go to their site, they've got a really sort of lofty goal where, hey, use NGRX data, and maybe you'll never have to write actions, reducers, selectors, et cetera, again. And from what I've heard, uh, by the way, this is something I think by John Papa, Ward Bell, and maybe a couple of others, but what I've heard is this may be getting rolled into NGRX proper. Maybe we'll hear more from that team about this later. It's the hot thing here. Uh, there are over nine, or no, there are nine talks going on here just at ng-conf. You can learn about things like authentication, building custom schematics, reducing boilerplate, anything you want to learn about NGRX, you can probably get it here at ng-conf. And then for tools, there's a lot of great tools, but one of them I thought we should highlight is Stacklets. And if you've kind of been following along the Angular.io site evolution, you might have noticed that we've switched our uh, example code editor to Stacklets this year. Yeah, woo, yeah, that's pretty cool. Where th they've just done a really wonderful job letting you instantly start editing and running an Angular application in the browser with no CLI setup, no desktop, anything that you have to do. And you actually, in a lot of ways, get a better experience than you can on the desktop for uh, like dealing with like installing new NPM packages, this is actually faster than I can get on local NPM because of some of the caching that they can do. And I also saw this really cool bookmarklet you can check out called ng-now. There's a link. We'll share these slides later. You don't have to write it down. Where I can install it in my bookmark bar. I can go to any GitHub repo that was designed, that was built with the Angular CLI. I can drag it to the bookmark bar, and it launches stacklets in the browser, and I can instantly start editing those applications. You'll hear more from the folks who built Stacklets, Albert and Eric, later today, where they are actually talking about building PWAs, I think, with Stacklets, and uh, they can tell you more about how that all works. So then developers, like the reason people come to Angular is because this is where we can get our job done best. And we want to continue investing in this. Um, and so there's a couple categories of things that we're doing to make this easier. One, there's sort of some logistical stuff, and then there's a bunch of features that we're announcing in the V6 product. So logistical things, um, we actually have a release candidate for AngularJS 1.7. Um, a little bittersweet, this is going to be the last release for AngularJS. And thank all of you who have been with us on this journey. Now, we also know that a lot of you are going to be maintaining these applications for many years. A lot of applications never go away. And so what we're doing is we're going to ensure that you're going to be supported all the way through 2021. So we're going to be doing a period of bug fixing until about June, uh, end of June 2018. And then we're going to go into a long-term support phase where we'll be doing critical security fixes. And if browsers ever make incompatible changes with Angular, make sure that those happen so you can know that you can continue to support your Angular JS applications. Moving on to Angular 6. We're dangerously close to release. <laughs> we thought we were going to have it before the conference, but we wanted to make it make sure it was great for everyone, uh, probably a week or two out. But the next set of stuff that I'm talking about is stuff you can go see in our release candidates right now, and then in a week or so, this will be final bits that you can go home and integrate with your projects. 
L again, a couple logistical things. We're trying to make things easier for you to adopt in your companies. Last year, we announced that we're doing long-term support for every other major release. So for Angular 4, we had like a six-month development program where we're actively developing it. And then after that, as we started v5, we would have a long-term support, patches, security updates, all that kind of good stuff. And so the, the idea was that there would be some overlap, and uh, v6 would be a, a place you could jump to. But folks often ask, can you folks on the Angular team not count? There's a thing in between. Um, maybe it would be nice if you just supported all of the major releases. And so that's what we're announcing today, is that all major releases are going to have this sort of long-term support. OK, yes, we can count. <laughs> Thanks. Another thing that we're doing that we think is going to just help mentally for folks is aligning the release numbers. And so you notice uh, you know, we have Angular at version 5, Material recently it aligned with Angular, and CLI, though, is at 1. So starting with version 6, all of the releases are going to come out together. And so it's just going to be easy to know what goes with what. My socks can match my whatever. Yeah. It's good. All right. So we did a developer survey earlier this year. And there was about 16,000 folks responded. So thank you, all of you who said, uh, who said something to us. That was great. But far and above, the thing that most people like the most about Angular is the CLI and how much it helps reduce the amount of work you have to do. And so in Angular 6, we're doubling down on the CLI. And a lot of the features that are, were coming out are helping in the CLI, making development easier and faster. So we've been talking for a while about how one of the infrastructural components in the CLI is this thing called schematics. And schematics, you can just think, just think about as templates and code transformations that allow you to do things to your Angular project. And you're already, you've already been users of this. If you use uh, ng-new, that uses the new schematic. And if you use ng-generate, there's a slew of schematics in there that help you generate components and directives and pipes and whatnot. Now, you can use our, the schematics to extend or replace any of those. Um, but I think we're going to do a better job uh, just kind of doing stuff for you in that arena uh, if you don't want to go build your own schematics. We're, we're actually introducing two new sort of top-level commands in the CLI that make use of new types of schematics that I think really expand the ecosystem for how we maintain our code and make libraries more easy to use in the Angular world. So the New commands are ng-update and ng-add, and let's take a dive in. So we really want you to stay up to date on the latest version of Angular so that you can take advantage of all of the great new features that you're seeing in Angular 6 and beyond. And to make that super easy, we have this new command called ng-update. Now, ng-update will automatically update your NPM de dependencies when we come out with a new version. And wherever we can, we'll update your code to take advantage of new APIs. And so in Angular 6, we're coming out with uh, this ng update that will also update your RxJS and material design code to take advantage of those new API changes. We think this is going to be a true game changer. <laughs> now, if you're a library vendor, you can do this too. ng-update is there. You can publish a schematic that automatically updates folks' Angular developers to your new version, and we hope you do. So we hope this is the start of a, of a whole ecosystem of where I do almost no code maintenance, and I get to be on the latest version of whatever comes out. Now, ng-add. So in ng-add ng allows me to just really seamlessly and easy, easily add new capabilities to my applications. And so behind the scenes, it just does the adding of code and scaffolding and maybe changing my project a little bit to take advantage of whatever sort of aspect I want to add to it. Some examples from the Angular team itself, we are going to have ng-add schematics for Angular material. I can just add that. Angular elements, we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. And progressive web apps, probably more in the future. And I'm super happy that uh, some of our other folks in the community are building this as well. So right out of the gate, you're going to be able to ng-add, ng-bootstrap, the Clarity UI design system, 
and NativeScript for building native applications for Android and iOS with Angular. And this is super easy. So on the command line, if I want to use these things, if I want to ng-add a progressive web app, I just say ng-add at Angular slash PWA. Similarly, for elements or material, and it's just as easy with some, a library that doesn't come from the Angular team. Uh, for Bootstrap, it's Bootstrap slash schematics. For Clarity, it's slash Angular. And for NativeScript, um, coming real soon, uh, it'll be NativeScript slash schematics. We've actually been working with the NativeScript team for quite a while, and they have actually an extensive library of both uh, add and generate scripts that are going to allow you to really easily both start applications as native script and then extend existing applications to the mobile environment. Once you've added these capabilities, these library authors can also offer generate schematics to allow you to really easily add things. So for example, if I've added the material uh, library to my applications, I might now want to do something like add a top nav bar. And so with a simple command like ng-generate material slash or colon material dash nav, and I give it a name, it all of a sudden adds a uh, top nav to it. Um, if you want to see how this is all done, check out Jeremy's talk later today right after lunch where he'll actually demonstrate Angular material using these add and generate scripts so you can see how it all works together. Now, one other thing that we've heard from folks in the community is that it's been a little bit hard to build libraries for Angular, and we want to make that easier. And so we've been working with, um, actually, Stephen, who's, who's the guy behind NG Library? David Hergis, yeah. So we have to thank David Hergis in the community who, um, who built support for building Angular libraries. And we're actually integrating this with him into the CLI to make it easy for all of you to generate libraries for Angular. Yeah, that's cool. So this will take care of your project scaffolding, build, build out your test infrastructure, and then set up your build system so you can easily create and deploy the bundles for your libraries in Angular. All right, Angular Elements. Um, we've been talking about this for a while, but uh, Angular version 6 is going to be the first time where we have a fully supported sort of non-demo version of Angular Elements. And so what is this? Well, when I'm building Angular applications, uh, I build an Angular app and I put Angular components inside it. But what if I've built applications in other environments, or if there's people at my company or people around the world who build these things, They've built in maybe jQuery or React or Vue or Ember or whatever they've built in. How would I do this? I mean, is this possible? Does it make sense? I don't know. Um, well, this is where Angular Elements comes in. And what it allows us to do is wrap Angular components as custom elements. Now, you might be saying, well, what is custom elements? And, I, and to that, I respond, you don't have to care. Uh, custom elements, you can just think of them as DOM elements, and as it turns out, Every web framework in the world, or every non-web framework, just vanilla JS, I know how to deal with DOM elements. So if we can wrap our Angular elements as these things that just look like DOM elements, I can just use them. And so for you as a provider of an embeddable Angular component, you just write your components, and there's a couple lines of code you'll use to wrap them as a custom element. You create a JavaScript bundle that people can load. They import the script and then just use it, and by just use it, I mean something like this. If I've built a, a pop-up, they just put in the HTML in their template somewhere, and the Angular pop-up will come up. Pretty cool. You can hear all about it in Rob's talk later today at 420 in Angular Elements in V6 and beyond. All right. then. My last section is on building great user experiences in Angular. And you probably know some of the things that we already do to help support building these applications to have great user experiences. One of them, of course, material design, the suite of components that we make at Google. Even if you're not using material design, we actually expose the infrastructure we used to make the material design components in the component dev kit where you could take advantage of all of our libraries that do accessibility and right to left and internationalization and popover positioning and all these cool things. Jeremy's going to talk about them later today. 
We've got a rich suite of animations, so you can do fun things. Uh, I know Sam's going to talk later today about uh, using reusable animation libraries. And then internationalization and localization, yeah, we've got support for that. But one of the things we think about a lot on the Angular team is speed as a feature. It's going to be one of the things that's most critical to your users. And so to make sure that your applications can start fast, we have support for server-side rendering, where you can make that first view of the application render on the server, and then just load in HTML and CSS. So there's really no JavaScript they have to download to get going. And so that your application can stay fast, we have support for progressive web apps. So after they've come to your application once, your application can be cached. And so the next time they come back, it's all very fast. You can learn more about strategies for server-side rendering with Vikram from the Angular team on Friday. He's actually been working with some big teams at Google, integrating server-side rendering into their products. He's got some learnings to share. And then for progressive web apps, there's a couple different talks, but I might suggest go to the one with Anas on how to score 100 on an Angular PWA audit. That means in the Lighthouse Tools suite. But then we also know that OK, well, I can server-side render, and I can cache. But at some point, you actually have to get the bits down to the user's browser. And so if you've been following along from Angular version 2 to 4 to 5 and now to 6, we've been making it possible to build smaller and smaller initial bundle sizes so that users can get going with your applications much quicker. In version 6, we've got a really tremendous feature called tree-shakeable providers which allows you to use a new API so that your providers can be tree shaken away if they're not needed. So that initial bundle that users load doesn't have to pull in the whole world of providers in your application. And we think you're going to get a big boost by just using this new API for the way you define your, define your providers. Okay. So that's all the stuff that's been going on in version 6. Uh, there is some, there's a couple of new things that we're going to be working on uh, this year that I want to get folks excited about as well. So I'd like to invite Mishko Hevry up. Mishko is the founder of Angular, uh, and he's going to talk about some of our next-gen stuff we're working on. Good morning. Good morning, Utah. It's awesome to be here again. Uh, it's always fun coming here. Uh, so I want to get you excited about what's coming down the pipe in the future. So let's see if we can look at it. We're working on this thing called, we call the Ivy project. It is the next generation Angular render. And for those of you guys who are keeping track of, uh, uh, this will be our third render. And this is the cool part about declarative UI is that from time to time, we get to replace the render, and you won't notice, other than your applications are faster and smaller. And we can do this, and we have done this before, between version 2 and version 4. We have gone from the original render to something called View Engine. And if you remember, um, the applications got smaller and faster, and we had uh, almost no reports of incompatibilities. And so we're hoping to do the same exact thing again by uh, replacing the render again. <clears throat> and I want to show you why some of these benefits in here is something that you really you should care about. Uh, the things we're focusing on Angular is what we call smaller, faster, simpler. And for the, um, for the end user of, of somebody who's actually using an application in, on their phone or a, or a desktop, they care about size because it allows them to get the application running faster on their mobile device. Uh, fewer bits come across the wire, et cetera, so smaller is important for them. For developers, for which is most of you guys, uh, it's important to be able to uh, to have simplified API for using this thing, also have a faster rebuild times, uh, increase uh, easiness of development. All of these things is something that uh, Ivy is focusing on. And finally, for the community, it is important for us that we can have a more a hackable um, pipeline so that people can come in and try to experiment with different ideas and introduce it into it. Uh, current pipeline is not. Uh, so easy to figure out what's going on. So with, with Ivy, we're hoping that it will be more um, inviting for people to experiment with. Now, I really want to talk about the importance of backwards compatibility so that no changes are required for your existing applications to uh, use Ivy. So one day, we will release this. 
you will upgrade your, uh, ver of your package version of Angular, and you will get the new benefits of Ivy. And it, it should be a seamless experience other than all of a sudden you have these new features. And, and let me prove to you why this is the case. So within Google, we have over 600 applications that are currently written using uh, the new Angular. And we also have this thing called the one version policy, which basically requires that we only have one version of Angular inside of the Google code base. And all of these applications that we have, they all have to run on the same version of Angular. And so which version of Angular do you think we have? Well, we actually commit uh, the head of GitHub into Google on, on several times a day, you know, really on an hourly basis, we're pushing this into Google. And every single commit has to be able to pass all through these 600 applications, and they have to continue to work. So even if we wanted to introduce a breaking change, uh, some of these applications would immediately say, like, hey, I'm not working anymore, and the, and the owners of these applications would force us to roll back that particular change. So we have a great uh, real-world kind of a test suite to prove to us that we cannot stray from the uh, backwards compatibility. This is kind of the enforcement. So the, by the time you get uh, the code base and you, you get to play with the code base, it has been vetted by through these many, many applications. Now, there's many features to uh, Ivy, and Kara is going to show you some amazing demos uh, that are coming up. But I want to talk about one particular feature or one particular philosophy that we care about with Ivy, and we call this locality. And locality is a very simple concept that simply means that when the compiler is translating your template, which you have written, into JavaScript, uh, it is only allowed to use information that's directly available on a component uh, and its decorator, right? So it cannot use, uh, it cannot go far away from that component. It cannot look at you know the, the dependencies of the component or the global analysis, et cetera. This is in contrast to the current compiler, which actually requires global analysis to run. So locality simply just means you're only allowed to look at individual files, individual uh, components at a time when generating the output. Now, it seems like a, such a simple um, philosophy, but it actually has huge impacts. And I want to talk about some of these. So the first big impact is that it allows you to ship AOT precompiled code into NPM which means that the developers who are using your particular library, let's say it's material design, they don't have to worry about compiling it with AOT because the thing they're getting is already AOT. And it also means that the difference between AOT and JIT becomes pretty much indistinguishable. You can freely mix components that are in AOT, which are in JIT, so you have downloaded you know, material design that has been uh, in NPM and it's already pre-compiled in AOT, but for whatever reason, in development mode, you choose to use JIT or for your test, you use JIT. It's perfectly fine. They can mix and match. Of course, for production, we always recommend that you use AOT. Uh, that means that the, we don't have a need anymore for metadata JSON. Uh, so because it's, it's, uh, the, the requirement to have metadata JSON is removed, it's much easier for tools to process your, your uh, code base, more tools become compatible with the NPM packages and so on. And so this simplifies both the creation of packages, because you no longer have to produce metadata JSON, but also consumption of packages as well. And then all of this means is that your compilation will have faster co recompile times. So as you're building an application and you need to change something, you don't have to, it's less likely that a change in one component will cause a triggering recompilation of the whole application. And finally, this is my personal pr favorite, metaprogramming, uh, locality allows for metaprogramming. It means that you can create components, modules, directive spice dynamically at runtime inside of your application and make them work with the rest of the application that you're building. Um, if you think about it, an example of metaprogramming is something like higher order components. Uh, this becomes possible with uh, locality. It is not necessarily something that I'm saying that I'm, I'm endorsing higher components. I'm simply saying that it becomes possible. And here's our roadmap. So as you can see, we have already done a lot of work on building the Ivy runtime, uh, run which some of it will be uh, demoed soon. Uh, we're re in the process of rewriting the compiler so that it has this locality principle that we're talking about. As soon as all of these things are available, we'll make them available for you as a beta to try. Uh, and then we're going to go through a Google verification process where we're going to make sure that we can uh, execute on, a, on all of the 600 applications that I've talk, told you about earlier. And of course, if we find some discrepancies, that means we have to change Ivy, not the 600 applications. 
Uh, and so when we are successfully be able to pass all 600 applications, uh, the, the code base will be ready for, uh, for you guys to try it out. Now, I also want to say thank you to a couple of community members, uh, without which uh, Ivy would probably not be here. Uh, they have done a great job of evangelizing it, produced uh, many ideas behind Ivy, and helped us with implementation of, of Ivy as well. So now I'd like to invite on stage Kara. Kara is a core Ivy developer. Uh, she is a pretty amazing uh, and prolific coder. She has produced more Ivy code than the rest of the world combined. Uh, and so she's going to demo some of the great features that we have up and coming for you. Coming up. That's OK. Hey, thank you, Mishko. Okay, so as he mentioned, I'm here to really dig into some of the changes that we've made to the rendering pipeline and the benefits that those will bring to your Angular apps. So the biggest change, aside from locality, which Mishko has already explained, is that the new rendering pipeline has been designed with tree shaking in mind. So in other words, the renderer code has been rewritten so that Angular code that you're not using can be tree shaken away in a build step. This is really exciting because it means that your bundle code is going to be significantly smaller. So as Angular developers, you won't have to change the way that your code is written. So because all of these changes are in Angular internals. But I'm going to take the time to explain um, how this new design works under the hood. Because first of all, because it's really cool. And <laughs> also because uh, I really want you to understand uh, what these changes will mean and why you're going to get better results with Ivy than with Angular today. So let's start by taking a step back and talking about tree shaking. If you haven't heard of tree shaking, it's essentially a build optimization step that ensures that unused code doesn't end up in your final bundle that you ship to the browser. And typically, unused code comes from third-party libraries. So in this example, you might be using thirdparty.js. And let's say you're just using the top function, but you're not using unused function on the bottom. You want to make sure that unused function doesn't end up in your bundle. And that's where tree shakers come in. There are a bunch of different tools that you can choose from, like Rollup, which uses live code inclusion to make sure that code that you're not using will never be added to the bundle in the first place. Or Uglify, which is more of a compressor that takes your already bundled code and tries to intelligently delete any dead code from that. But whichever tool that you're using, um, their efficacy really depends on how you're writing your code. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So let's say this is the code that, um, that you've written. You're importing some function from your third party library. Uh, and you're calling some function in main. So will some function be retained in your bundle? Well, absolutely. You're using it. You need it. Um, Tree shaking tools typically use static analysis of references as a heuristic to determine what symbols need to be retained in your bundle. So since some function is referenced in main, uh, it will be retained, and everything will work exactly the way you expect. But let's take another example. Uh, let's say that you want to use unused function, but only if some conditional check passes. So when this code runs, the condition will be false, because we're passing in false there at the bottom. Um, so we still don't actually need unused function, because that code path is never going to run. But will unused function be retained in your bundle after tree shaking? And unfortunately, the answer is yes, it will. Um, remember that tree shaking tools typically use static analysis. Um, so since there's a reference to unused function in main, that reference uh, will retain the symbol in, in your bundles. Um, and this is because with static analysis, um, it tries to determine what what functions are needed without actually running your program. And there are limitations to this. Um, it has to kind of assume the worst case in your code to ensure that the resulting program is correct. So in this case, it can't be certain that unused function won't be used, and so it's retained. So this is the type of pattern that we try to avoid um, when we've been rewriting our rendering pipeline. So with that context in mind, let's kind of circle back and talk about how the rendering pipeline works today. So you write your template HTML, and that runs through the Angular compiler, which parses your template code and generates some highly optimized JavaScript that represents the structure of your template. At runtime, this data structure that you've already generated is passed to the Angular interpreter, which tries to determine, based on your template data, 
what kind of operations it needs to run to create the DOM. So in practice, it might look something like this. <clears throat> Let's say you have a Hello World template with a div and a class. Today, we might generate something like this. You have a view definition, inside of which there is an element definition for the div, and a text node definition for Hello World. So these are all just creating kind of the structure of your template. This definition is passed into the Angular interpreter. And um, the interpreter tries to determine which operations need to run. So the important thing to note here is that, um, so this works pretty well, but the only problem is all Angular templates have to run through the same code path. So the Angular interpreter can't know what kind of templates it's going to see ahead of time. So it has to check to see which operations are needed and which operations aren't needed. And as we reviewed earlier, it doesn't matter if these conditions are actually false at runtime. Uh, even if these code paths aren't used, these symbols will be retained. So these functions will be in your bundle even if you're not actually using them. So when we re redesigned the rendering pipeline, we had this problem in mind. So instead of generating template data and passing it into an interpreter, which has to know how to do everything, instead, we can generate template instructions directly. Um, and this is really cool. So I'm going to show you what that, what that looks like. So if we look at the same template that we were looking at before with Hello World, um, and today we're going to generate, or not today, in Ivy, we're going to generate something like this. Um, we have an element start instruction that knows how to create your element in the DOM. We have a text instruction that knows how to create text nodes in the DOM, and an element end instruction that just does some housekeeping. But the point to keep in mind here is that we're generating the direct instructions that will do the work for your template. Um, so if we look back at the Angular code now, we no longer have this big function with all of these conditional checks that knows how to do everything. Instead, we have these kind of more atomic functions that um, do just the work uh, that you need. So you're only generating uh, the code that you need from the template that you've written. So if you're not using containers or listeners or pipes in your template, uh, these instructions won't be generated. And so there won't be references. And if there aren't references, the tree shaking tools can successfully remove this code from your bundle. So we're using this strategy with all of the core features that we can think of. So if you're not using content projection or structural directives or queries or what have you, tree shaking tools will be able to remove this code from your bundle. And this means much smaller bundles, which is really exciting. Um, and much smaller bundles mean faster startup time. And a side benefit is these instructions that we generate are much more human readable. They're easier to understand. And most importantly, they're easier to debug. Um, so once you're stepping through your application and trying to figure out what's going wrong, it's nice to be able to see exactly how Angular is interpreting your template and how it's running your code. So, with that in mind, we're going to go through a few very quick demos just to show what generated code looks like with a new pipeline. Um, so we'll start with a Hello World so you can see the instructions. And then we'll do a typical debugging experience with Ivy um, using a to-do app. So let's make sure everything is running. OK. All right. So we have this Hello World app that I've already pre-written. And it's pretty simple. It's just a div that says hello with a binding for world. And you can see that we're writing it the same way that we write Angular today, right? With a component decorator and an ng module. Um, you might notice that this, this bootstrapping call is a little bit different. It's using render component. This is our new API for bootstrapping that's a little bit simpler. Um, but don't worry, it's completely optional. You can decide to use it, or you can use whatever bootstrapping code you have today. So given this code, if we run it through oops, the IV compiler, let me get out of this mode. Um, you can see that we have this Hello World app. And it's pretty interesting. It just says Hello World. Um, but the thing that I want to show you is the code that we're actually generating. So the class that we've written for Hello World is right here. And you can see that the at component decorator has been turned into this define component call. That's kind of the way that you would um, equate them in the template code. So the code that we really want to look at, though, is this template function here. And this template function contains the instructions that we've been talking about. 
So you can see here that um, if it's in creation mode or if it's running for the first time, uh, it's going to create your div element, it's going to create your text node, and then once it's in update mode, it's going to update the text binding that corresponds to this text node that you've created. So it's pretty human understandable. Um, so if you were to search for any of these symbols, um, obviously you'd find them because they're, they're being retained correctly so that this program can run. Um, so you'll find element start, you can find text binding in here, which is exactly as you'd expect. But if you were to remove some things from this template, let, let's say you remove the div, and let's remove the binding, we can just say some shameless pandering here. Um, so if you allow this to recompile for a second, what you're gonna see is once we've removed the element and the binding, the code needed to generate elements and bindings is no longer necessary because we're not using these features. So, oh, I guess we should see if this reloads. Okay, so now if you look at our generated code, you can see that the instructions have changed, right? So now we're only using this text instruction to create our static text node. And if you search for text binding now, or element start, they're no longer in the bundle because they've been successfully tree shaken away by our tooling. So it's pretty cool. OK, so now I'm going to go on to the to do app demo. So we're, we'll start the dev server for that. OK, and while we're waiting, let's, oopsies, not break hello world. Let's go to our to-do index. I'll show you what the code looks like. So this is a real to-do app. Um, you have a to-do store. There is this big template that has all of these elements. You have all these property bindings and listeners. This is kind of like a real application that you might write um, with Angular. And you'll notice that it's, again, written like you would write Angular applications today because we're completely backwards compatible. And what you get once we are loaded, which we are, So just waiting for localhost. Okay, so what we get is this to do app right here. Um, so you can see that you can you know, complete things, you can delete to do's, you can add to do's like this. Um, so it's you know, a to do app. But if you look in the console, you'll see that it's broken. Um, there is an error, and it changed after checked error. You might have seen this error if you're an Angular developer. <laughs> um, and I, I wanted to show you this error specifically so you kind of see the delta between debugging this type of error uh, with Angular today versus Ivy. So with Ivy, when you're looking at the stack trace, you can tell exactly where the problem is happening. Um, with Angular today, there's nothing in the stack trace that really tells you what line of code um, is broken. But if you look in this stack trace, you can see that the template function is in the trace. Um, so if you have your source maps enabled, you can just click directly on that line and with source maps, you can be directed to the exact line in your template that's causing the problem. Yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> um, so in this case, we know that it's this class dot panic binding that's causing all this trouble. So we could fix that. Um, another implication of this is that you can put breakpoints in your templates. So if you wanted to see exactly how this header element is being created by Angular. If we refresh the page, um, it'll stop here. And then you can step into the instruction that will be generated for this template. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, and you can see exactly how Angular is going to render your element. You can see, if you look, scroll here over the right, that it's receiving the header name. You can um, step through this function, see how your directives are being matched. Um, it's really easy to see exactly what's happening under the hood. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And I want to show you one more thing, which is I have the to-do app also running on a prod server here. And we've been talking a lot about tree shaking and what this will do for your bundles. Um, and the to-do app is a real Angular app that has you know, functions and functionality. And so if you wanted to see how big a real Angular app might be, you can see that this whole to-do app is only 12.2 KB. It's exciting. <laughs> okay. so, so with that, I'm going to give it back to Mishko. Thank you, Kara. Wasn't that amazing? Are you excited about the future? 
Come on. Okay, this is a retro conference, right? We're going back to the 80s. So let's go back two years ago. Uh, and actually, it was in this very room two years ago that Brad was standing up here, and he made this audacious goal of saying that Hello World could be under 10 kilobytes. Let's find out if it is. Now, he also made a promise, says if you guys get 10, uh, Hello World under 10 kilobytes, he will bake us a cake. What do you think? <clears throat> so, to do app compressed, is 12.2, but it's not a Hello World app, right? So the question is, if we build a Hello World app, will we tree shake away at least uh, two and a half kilobytes? So here's where we are today. So currently compressed, <laughs> we are at 36 kilobytes. There's a cake threshold of 10 kilobytes. Now, he did not specify whether he's talking about minified or compressed. So let's find out how big the minified is. You guys ready? Come on, I'm gonna milk this thing, yeah, all right. So, a minified Hello World is 7.3 kilobytes. And when you run it through a compressor, it comes down to 2.7 kilobytes. Two point seven kilobytes. That's kind of impressive. Uh, yes, but anyways. Um, so, cake was promised, and cake will be delivered. There is a cake waiting all around, uh, in the background, waiting for you guys to enjoy it. So, cake it so.